I posted an announcement yesterday, I'm sure that you all saw that, um, where I added, um, there's a video within the announcement walking through the six most missed questions. Um, and I know I say this in the video, but um, every time you take a test, if there are any questions where more than 75% of the class um, misses the question, then um, if only 25% get it right, then I figure it's probably an issue with the question or maybe I didn't talk about it enough. Um, so I went over those six and your grades were inflated for those six, okay? Um, I did get a couple of questions um, over the weekend asking if your exam would be available, if you can go back and look at it. Um, I am not doing that this semester. Um, one of the problems with an online class letting you go back into the exam is that uh, you, I can't make it secure in any way for you to just look at it. Um, so uh, I have found that tests very quickly get compromised because students um, do screenshots and take pictures and then they share it with their friends. And so um, even though each of you had a different test, um, the tests are test banks. Um, I'm still not comfortable opening it up without it being proctored in some way, and I can't do that. So I'm so sorry, uh, but that is why I do go over the most missed questions, uh, because chances are if you missed one, it was one of those. Do y'all have any questions? I do. Okay, what you got, Annalie? Um, for the lab, I was watching the um, uh, the answers, and on one of them, it was talking about. Oh my gosh, I don't even remember what unit it was. Um, it you know how you have a word bank up there? Uh -huh. Okay, well one of them didn't have the words on there. Like I think it was the papillary and the um, reticular. Okay. And it was, the option wasn't up there. I think it was, uh, uh, it was like naming the connective tissue instead of the papillary. Oh, okay. So it was um, like papillary layer or areolar tissue. Right. And then reticular layer or dense irregular connective tissue. Yes, and I labeled the opposite, and it wasn't because you put um, papillary instead of areolar. Okay. So I just didn't know if you were going to count off for of that or not. Is that, was that on the exam or was that on the quiz? Um, it was just on the, P the PDF. Oh, so I have not graded those yet. I have not. I spent yesterday during your exam. Um, so yeah. today, once we're done um, with lecture today, I'll go over the PDF documents and um, I'll go over uh, your quizzes. Um, but no, you won't be counted off if you pick one or the other. Like if you say, depends on the question on the quiz. Now, if the question is what kind of tissue is in this layer, then you would have to tell me the tissue type. Mm -hmm. um, but um, for the PDF, no, I won't count off for that. In fact, your PDFs, you know, I don't, um, I don't put comments on your PDF documents for lab. Mm -hmm. I have like 110 students and it would take days for me to thoroughly grade and put comments and tell you what you missed and the right answer, which is why I do a video and I go over them with you every Monday. Um, and so typically how the PDF document grading works is I kind of go through everybody's and if I'm noticing that um, yours all look correct, then you get a five out of five. If I'm noticing that you've missed a couple, then you'll get a four out of five. So make sure if you have anything other than a five out of five, you need to go back and watch that video if you weren't able to attend lab on Monday right? Um, and then if it looks like about half are correct, you get like a three out of five. And so I have that grading scale posted. Um, it's in a rubric in each of the PDF uploads. So you can look at that rubric. Um, but that's typically how I grade that. So if you have one or the other, Annalie, I'm, it's, you're fine. Okay, thank you. Sure. Any other questions y'all can think of?
Okay. All right. So let me um, share my screen with you. And we will um, finish out chapter six this morning. Um, I will tell you that um, next week we start into chapter seven and the lecture for chapter seven isn't super hard and it will probably only take one day. It'll just be Monday. Um, and what I'll do with you on um, Wednesday, the lab next week is incredibly difficult. Um, the chapter seven lab is super difficult. It is also the most difficult lab when you do this in the face-to-face -face class. So um, basically your lab so far, other than the tissue lab, which is a lot of memorizing, um, haven't been super hard in terms of the structures you're memorizing and learning. But next week you are going to be doing bones and bone markings. So we're looking at the skull. Um, you're going to know all the names of the bones of the skull, plus you're going to know major bone markings. A bone marking is like a groove or a depression or a projection that is there to allow blood vessels to pass or it's forming a joint, um, but they are important points on that bone. And so for the skull, we'll have bones and bone markings, and then we'll do all the rest of the skeleton as well. Um, so what I will do with you next Wednesday, which is this is sort of out of the norm, um, because the lecture will only, for chapter seven, will only take Monday. On Wednesday during our lecture time, I am actually going to um, kind of do a lab review with you to kind of help you through your lab PDF for chapter seven, because it is going to be a tough one, okay? Um, so if you can make it, great, and if you can't next Wednesday, um, if you want to watch that video, you can do that as well. So I just wanted to give you a heads up on that. All right. Um, I've got to move a few things around on my screen. Okay. All right, so um, this is where we left off. So remember, since we did not have um, class on Monday, it was a holiday, um, I, do, I did tell you that to go ahead and watch part 6A, um, which is the first part of chapter six. I also created a little video for um, the lab from last week for chapter five, which is posted in that media gallery. Um, and so this is where uh, that video recording left off from chapter six. So this chapter, is all about bones and bone physiology. So essentially, how do your bones grow? And what we did in the first part of um, chapter six is we kind of walked through um, the function of bones. We also talked about different types of bones in the body, how you have bones that are long. So like your humerus is a long bone. It's longer than it is wide. And then we have other bones in the body, like short, flat, and irregular bones. We talked about those. We also talked about the difference between compact bone versus spongy bone. And then we also walked through sort of the microscopic structure of bone, like what are all the components that we can see under a microscope. So I walked you through what that looks like. I also talked a little bit, um, and if you kind of paid attention, that microscopic structure of bone should look a whole bunch like what it looks like under the microscope, you know, the little tree rings. So we talked about all those parts and pieces. And then we also dug down even deeper and talked about uh, the chemical composition of bone. Um, <clears throat> and then we started into physiology a little bit in that lecture where we talked about bone growth and bone formation. Um, and we did it in terms of an embryo. So we are truly, as we go through bone physiology in this chapter, we're doing it kind of from three aspects. So one is how do your bones form? To begin with in an embryo how are they forming so we walked through that and then the second one which is what we're picking up with here is what we call postnatal bone growth which means literally post means after and natal means birth so this literally means bone growth after you're born so once a baby is born, right, their bones are going to continue to grow in length and they're going to get much taller. 
Um, and so uh, the third way that we're going to talk about it today is once you're done growing, so, you know, you go through this postnatal bone growth, you get taller, well, eventually you reach your adult height, right? And so once you're done growing, the third way is that your bones aren't quite done, and that is that they're constantly remodeling. So they are always going to change based on the force and the demands that you place on them. Okay, so we're going to hit those second, those last two. We already did how your bones form in an embryo. So today we'll do postnatal bone growth after you're born, how are you growing in length? And then we'll also talk about once you're done growing, how do your bones remodel? Okay, and what that actually means. Um, so in terms of growth and length of a bone, um, you are growing, your bones are growing from that epiphyseal plate. And the epiphyseal plate is always found in the epiphyses, that rounded big end of a long bone. Um, and it looks like a little line in there. And that epiphyseal plate is filled with cartilage. And the cartilage has three functionally different zones within it. And those are listed right here. There's an area of cartilage that's growing. There's an area in the cartilage called the transformation zone. And that word transformation, I think, gives it away. To transform means to change, right? So this is an area where we're going to start to shift from cartilage into bone. And then the third zone is the osteogenic zone. And that one also gives it away. It has osteo at the beginning. We're turning it into bone, okay? So um, I'm going to walk you through um, these three zones. I'm going to show you a picture. So let's hit this picture first, just so you can kind of see what we're looking at. So this is showing you the epiphyseal plate, right? If we look over here, you can see this little line in the epiphyses. That's your growth plate, your epiphyseal plate. It is filled with cartilage, and you can see that in this image right here. And so I told you that cartilage has those three zones in it, okay? So it has this growth zone, okay? We call that a growth zone. It has this area here called the transformation zone. And then we have this area down here called the ossification zone. Okay, so those are our three zones in that cartilage. So let's talk about each of those. I'm gonna skip back. So the growth zone is an area of cartilage where the cartilage is just actively growing. Um, and truly how your bones are growing in length. I'll see if I can draw this. It's, let me see if I, y'all can still see me, right? Um, so I want you to pretend that this right here, my arm right here, this would be like part of the bone. And my fist at the end up here is the epiphyses. And you can kind of see how they're separated by, we'll say that's our growth plate, our epiphyseal plate. So truly what's happening when your bones are growing in length is the epiphyseal plate is growing, right? So it gets much bigger. And then underneath it, you replace it with bone. And then it grows and you replace it with bone. And it grows and you replace it with bone. So what you're doing is the shaft of the bone is getting longer as you go. You basically keep pushing the epiphyses away. So that gives you sort of a mental image of what's happening. So in the growth zone, this is where the cartilage is growing and it's pushing that epiphyses away from the diaphysis. So if we look here at the growth zone, I'll circle it. Here's the growth zone. If you look up close at this picture, so this is hyaline cartilage, right? We know it's cartilage, it's hyaline cartilage, the background's glassy, very pretty. One of the ways that you can tell that this cartilage is growing is I want you to look at the placement of those chondrocytes. Look at the cells. Notice that they're not randomly in there. They almost look like stacks of coins. Like, do you see how they're all like stacked on top of each other here? It's like a big long stack. That's telling you that this cartilage is actively growing and it's growing quickly, okay? So that's our growth zone just under the growth zone. So again, remember that epiphyseal plate, you have the growth zone. So you're gonna grow your cartilage, it's gonna get thicker, and then underneath you're gonna start to replace it with bone, okay? So that's our transformation zone. So underneath the growth zone, you have this area where we're gonna start to transform it. Again, think of the word transform, means to change. 
we're going to start to change it from cartilage into something else. Now, cartilage and bone are two different tissues. So you can't just turn cartilage into bone, but you can kill the cartilage. It can die, and then you can replace it with something. And that's what's happening in the transformation zone. The cartilage in this area is dying. And you can tell because the cells are hypertro hypertrophying. So they're getting big. To hypertrophy means to enlarge. And that is very common with cells that are older and that are dying. They kind of swell up and get big. The reason that the cartilage in this area is dying is because we are calcifying the matrix. I want you to think about what calcium does to a tissue, right? If we add calcium to our bones, it makes your bones hard. If you add calcium to cartilage, it's going to make your cartilage hard. Does cartilage have a blood supply? No. So cartilage, all the cells in cartilage get their nutrients through diffusion. So if you suddenly add calcium to the matrix, the matrix gets super hard and you can't get those nutrients to the cells, and the cells start to die. So this is why the cells are dying off. It's because we are calcifying that matrix, okay? So if we look at this picture again, we can see in this area, so this is the area where we have the hypertrophic zone. So you can see that the chondrocytes in the lacuna, you can see how much bigger they are in this area. So they are definitely swollen, they're old, they're starting to die. The reason is because we've calcified the matrix. Now you can see down in here all that calcium and you can see how the matrix looks very different. Okay, and then finally towards the bottom, this is closest to the diaphysis, we have the ossification zone. So we also can call it the osteogenic zone. Again, it starts with osteo, so it means bone. So in this case, we are laying down new bone. Um, so the cartilage is dead. We can now add bone in that, in that place. Okay, so this is how your bones are growing in length. They're growing from your growth plate, the epiphyseal plate right? And that epiphyseal plate has those three transitions in it. Cartilage is growing. Just under that, we're killing the cartilage. We're calcifying the matrix. It's dying. And under that, we're adding that new bone, making the shaft of the bone longer. Um, and so one thing that I want to point out, this is just um, a, an artist rendering, just a drawing here. Um, and you can kind of see here, you can see the epiphyses at the top. And here is that growth plate and you can see it's colored in blue for cartilage. You can also see we have cartilage around the end of the bone. Remember we call that articular cartilage. Um, one thing I want to point out here is, um, and we'll talk more about this towards the end of the chapter, but in your growth plate, when you are actively growing and you're hitting growth spurts, the growth plate is going to be much bigger. Um, and so that band of cartilage in there is going to be a lot bigger which means cartilage is not as strong as bone. So if you do something that might cause your bone to break, an easy place for it to break is gonna be at the growth plate. So it is not uncommon, especially in kids, when they are hitting these big growth spurts, if they break a bone, like a big bone, think like their femur or their humerus, if they break a bone, a lot of times it can break right at that growth plate. Problem is that remember, cartilage does not have a blood supply. So if you break your growth plate, which is filled with cartilage, it's gonna take a little bit longer to heal, right? Than if you break your bone, because bone has a great blood supply, so it heals a lot faster. So I want to talk to you just a little bit about what is regulating your bone growth. So when you hit these growth spurts, what's causing you to go through these growth spurts? There's actually two different things depending on your age. Um, it's hormones, but the hormones are different. Um, so it is hormonal regulation. Um, when you're little, right, from the time you're an infant um, all the way through childhood, it is a hormone called, we abbreviate it, HGH, which just stands for the human growth hormone. So this is a hormone that is actually released from the brain. It's released from the pituitary gland up in the brain. 
and it's telling your body when to grow and when to hit those growth spurts. And that's all when you're in childhood and infancy. Once you hit puberty, your body starts releasing sex hormones. Um, sex hormones like testosterone and estrogen. And these hormones turn off the human growth hormone. They say, ah, we got it from here. And it's that flood of those sex hormones that cause you to go through those huge growth spurts when you hit puberty. It is also these sex hormones that is causing the skeleton to become more masculine or more feminine, depending on the sex hormone that's being released. If you're releasing testosterone, that's typical in a male, and we're going to see the skeleton become more masculine. I don't know that I have any pictures in this lecture, but I do in the next to show you this. One of the places we can see a more masculine skeleton is down in the pelvis. If we look at the hip bones, in a male, the hip bones are very narrow and the narrow pelvis actually supports the heavier upper body that men typically have. Whereas if you're going through puberty and you're releasing a lot of estrogen, it's actually going to cause your hip bones to be wider. The hip bones of a female are more flared. Um, and this is actually just going to support childbearing. Um, it allows you to have a bigger birth canal and it allows you to carry that baby. Eventually, as your sex hormones start to drop off um, after puberty, um, it's going to cause your uh, epiphyseal plates, your growth plates, to close. Okay, so once your sex hormone levels kind of level out, um, then it's going to cause those growth plates to close over. Okay, um, interestingly enough, this is totally off topic, but I'll tell you anyway, um, we have a puppy, we have a golden retriever puppy, um, and um, there's been a lot of research on golden retrievers. You know, they have hip dysplasia. It's really common. They get really tall and lanky. Um, and um, the research has shown that show dogs, retrievers that are show dogs, typically have a smaller stature, stature as, a pair, as compared to dogs that are just pets. Um, and they say that it's because when you have a pet, typically you spay or neuter your pet very early. And when you do that, if they have not gone, come into puberty, like if you're female, we have a female dog, if she has not gone through heat yet, she's never released estrogen, she hasn't turned off that human growth hormone. And what happens if you spay too early, is the human growth hormone keeps kicking in their body and they keep growing. So your dog will end up being a little bit larger. Um, so um, for our dogs, for the breed that we have, they suggest waiting until they've had at least one or two heat cycles so that they can have those sex hormones and turn off that growth hormone. But I thought it kind of kind of goes with this. I thought that was kind of interesting. All right, so we've done how your bones grow in length, right? So now let's talk about, all right, so you've gone through puberty. Um, you know, I think I'm 5'6", and I think I was 5'6 when I was like 15, maybe. I think I was done growing by then. So even if you're done growing, your bones are not done. They are still constantly remodeling, which means they are building up and breaking down based on what your body needs. Um, and so um, we say that your bone is remodeling, meaning it is reabsorbed, it's broken down, and it's built up, it's added. And the cells that are helping you build up your bone and break it back down are the cells you already know. Osteoblasts, remember the B and blast for the B and build. So these build your bone, they make your bone. And osteoclasts, I remember C, D, destroy, okay? So osteoblasts build, osteoclasts destroy. So these are those cells that are helping us accomplish this. And one thing that's important to know is that even if you're done growing in length, your bones are still constantly remodeling and your bones are not remodeling uniformly, meaning some bones in your body will remodel much faster than other bones. This is all dependent on how you use your body and how you use your bones. It's based on the demands you place on your bones. Here's a great example. This is showing you the femur. So the femur is your thigh bone. This is the biggest, longest, strongest bone in the body. The shaft of the femur, the diaphysis, will last you a lifetime. So once you're done growing, I was done at 15, 
my the diaphysis of my femurs is the same one that I had when I was 15, right? But the distal epiphyses, so remember proximal and distal, those terms, proximal means closer to the point of attachment, distal means farther. So the distal epiphyses, which is down here, okay, that will be replaced every five months. That distal epiphyses makes that part of your knee joint. So that should make a lot of sense. You are constantly with walking and running and just moving in general, you are constantly wearing and tearing out um, that distal epiphyses. Your body's going to constantly be breaking it down and building it up. Okay. So I want to walk you through building up your bone and breaking it down. Okay. So that's all bone remodeling. So we say bone deposition, again, this is building the bone, is accomplished by osteoblasts. Remember B for build. So laying bone down is osteoblasts. And we're gonna do this anytime we've injured a bone. So if you've broken a bone, well, osteoblasts are gonna heal the break. They're gonna build some bone in that area. Or anytime you need more strength, so let's say, for example, this is a huge stretch. Let's say I'm a ballerina, right? And I'm on point shoes. Um, so, you know, up on my toes. Where I'm going to have the most stress on my bones is going to be on my feet and in my ankles. So my body, naturally, through my remodeling, will be laying new bone down in my feet and in my ankles because I need strength there. Okay. Now, in order for you to lay down new bone, you've got to have a good diet. You've got to be getting enough vitamin C, vitamin D, obviously enough calcium. Um, if you are malnourished, it's going to be very hard to do that. Bone reabsorption is the opposite. This is breaking your bone down. And again, this is through osteoclasts. So remember C, D, they destroy your bone. They break it down. So it might seem weird to think, when would I ever need to destroy my bone? Like why, makes sense why you would build it up, right? You break a bone, you need more strength. Why would you ever want to break your bone down? Remember when we talked about blood calcium levels and how calcium is essential and you need it for everything? You need it for muscles to contract, for glands to secrete, for nerves to fire. You need it for every physiological function. And what happens when your calcium level in your blood drops, your body goes, ooh, I don't have enough calcium in my blood. I better get some fast. Let me take it from my bone. How you're gonna take it from your bone is you're gonna destroy your bone. You're gonna break your bones down, right? So this is why you would need to reabsorb your bone. So bone reabsorption involves osteoclasts, which destroy your bone. And what osteoclasts do to destroy bone is they release lysosomal enzymes. Sorry, I have not been drinking this morning. <laughs> Coffee. Um, lysosomal enzymes. Remember the term lys means to break open. So these are some enzymes that break open all those cells that are in your bone and they help to digest through the matrix, the organic matrix of your bone. But remember your bone has an organic matrix and then it also has an inorganic matrix, the calcium salt. So also osteoclasts release acids and the acids take that calcium salt and liquefy it. And from there, it can go straight into your bloodstream. And so it's really important that we have osteoclasts that are able to destroy that bone, liquefy it, and get that calcium into your bloodstream to raise blood calcium levels if you need it, okay? So that is bone remodeling, right? So it is either building your bone up when you need extra strength or breaking it down, especially if you need blood calcium, if you need to raise your calcium levels. Um, so we say that bone remodeling, so this whole process of building your bone, breaking it down, it is regulated by two things. One is hormones. Um, and the hormones, we, your book calls it the hormonal mechanism, but truly this is maintaining a blood calcium level. Okay. And the reason why this is a hormonal mechanism is because it's, you have in your brain, you have an area of your brain that's constantly monitoring how much calcium is in your blood. And if calcium drops, you release a hormone that tells your osteoclasts, hey, 
get to work, break the bone down, liquefy that bone and get some calcium in our blood. So it's because of hormones that you're breaking your bone down or building it back up. And then the second uh, thing that regulates bone remodeling is mechanical and gravitational stress. So let's talk more about these. So again, you know, I mentioned the very first one, this hormonal mechanism has everything to do with blood calcium levels, right? We need calcium for everything. We need it for every physiological function happening in the body. Now I've listed a couple of things up here, right? Like nerve, nervous impulses, um, for muscles to be able to contract, for glands to secrete, for cells to divide, for your blood to clot. You have to have calcium for all of that stuff. In fact, as we go through this semester, we'll get into things like muscle physiology, and neurophysiology, and you're going to see where calcium plays a huge role in this process. And so um, what happens when your blood calcium level starts to rise? Let's talk about this one. So again, think of the amount of calcium in your blood. We have to maintain a certain level of calcium. And if there's ever an elevated level of calcium, right, if calcium levels start to go up, your brain goes, woohoo, I got extra calcium. Let me store it for later. And how you do that is your, your body will release a hormone called calcitonin. Calcitonin is actually coming from the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland is in the neck. It's kind of a butterfly shaped gland. And this is going to cause you to lay down new bone. You're going to deposit that extra calcium in your bone and the side effect is it's going to make your bones nice and hard. But if there's ever a time when your blood calcium levels drop, then your brain goes, oh crap, I don't have enough calcium in my blood. I've got to do all these functions. I can't do it. I need calcium fast. Your parathyroid, your parathyroid, which is a gland kind of like behind the thyroid gland, is going to release a hormone called parathyroid hormone. So it's abbreviated PTH. And the parathyroid hormone is what's going to tell those osteoclasts to start destroying your bone. Liquefy the bone, get that calcium liquid, get it into the bloodstream to raise blood calcium levels back up. And remember, this is all negative feedback, right? We talked about negative and positive feedback at the beginning of the semester. Negative feedback just means that if you're going in one direction, like blood calcium's going up, woohoo! Negative feedback is going to bring it back down, right? We're going to store the calcium and put it in our bones for later, okay? If blood calcium levels are dropping and your body goes, uh oh, negative feedback means we're going to break our bone down, we're going to liquefy calcium and put it back into our bloodstream. So the whole goal here is to maintain homeostasis, right? I'm gonna star this slide. You are gonna see questions about this on the next lecture exam. So I will ask you questions about blood calcium levels. I will ask you questions about those hormones that I circled. So you need to know what hormone is released when calcium levels go up. You need to know what hormone gets released when calcium levels go down, okay? This is, um, you know, your book likes these teeter-totter examples. And so this is just showing you here, you know, if blood calcium levels drop, um, again, you are going to release that parathyroid hormone. It's going to cause osteoclasts to start destroying your bone and your blood calcium levels will come back up. So I told you though that there are two things that regulate bone remodeling. So one is this hormonal loop. It's your calcium levels. The other is mechanical and gravitational stress, the forces that you put on your bones. And we actually see this, there is something called Wolf's Law where we can actually see this happening. Um, and Wolf's Law just states that a bone will grow or remodel in response to the force and the demands that we place on it. Okay, so I'm gonna give you some examples of Wolf's Law. Um, so one of them, um, I, I don't know if y'all have noticed this. I notice it. I'm not wearing my wedding ring today, but I can um, put my wedding ring on my left hand, my ring finger, right? It does not fit on my right ring finger because I'm right-handed. Because I'm right-handed, I use my right hand more because I use it more. There's more stress on it, which means these bones in my right hand are bigger than the ones in my left hand. 
So I don't know if you all noticed that, if you've ever noticed anything like that with your hands. Um, so handedness typically will result in the bones of one limb being thicker and stronger than the ones in the other limb. A curved bone, like your clavicle, right, your collarbone up here, this bone is sort of shaped like an S. And the reason it has that shape is actually curved in a way where, um, and it's really thick in an area where it's most likely to buckle and break. So we add extra bone anywhere where we think that bone is a little weaker so we can give it some more strength. In spongy bone, so remember our short, our flat, and our irregular bones, they look like sandwiches, right? They have compact bone on the outside, spongy bone on the inside. Trabeculae, remember these are the bone, the bars of bone, they almost look like bridge supports in our spongy bone. These are gonna form in spongy bone anywhere where you need more support. Again, I always think of trabeculae as like um, bridge supports, right? If you think of like a, road, a, a bridge over a road, um, if it seems a little weak in an area, you might prop it up with another post. That's like a trabeculae. We're gonna add those where we need a little more strength. And then the last one that's down here says, um, large bony projections will happen anywhere where you have big, heavy muscles attached. So um, a great example is on um, the skull. Um, you can kind of feel it. I have my headphones on. I'm not a gamer. I know it looks like I'm a gamer. <laughs> um, there is right behind your ear, if you kind of feel right behind your um, earlobe, you'll feel kind of a bump back there, a bony bump. Um, that's called the mastoid process. The mastoid process, I don't, I can turn my head to the side and you can see that muscle a little bit better. Y'all ignore my hair. So this muscle right here, this is a muscle called the stylo, oh, sorry, it's called the uh, sternocleidomastoid muscle. This is a muscle that when it contracts, I can turn my head side to side. This is a pretty big muscle, right? I would say that my child's muscle is really big because he always goes like this. <laughs> Um, but that muscle is pretty big, and because it connects right there on the skull, every time the muscle contracts, it's pulling on that little projection on the skull, and it's causing that projection to get bigger and bigger and bigger because it is stressing the bone. It's pulling on the bone. Um, another example would be on the femur. On the femur bone, which we'll look at next week, there are these big projections on that bone, and it's where your gluteal muscles connect to the bone. So every time you lift your leg to the back, those gluteal muscles are pulling on the bone, and you get these projections there that are bigger and bigger and bigger. So again, anytime you're putting stress or force on your bone, we're going to add new bone in that area. So it might cause projections to get really big. So this is a great example. This is showing you a tennis player. Um, and um, you can see here that her serving arm over here on um, the left, you can see that this would be like the humerus, right? And the humerus is your upper arm bone. And that bone you can see is thicker in the serving arm than in her non-serving arm. That's just Wolf's Law. So let's put both of those together, right? Let's put the hormonal mechanism together and the gravitational stress together. So I told you that your bones, when you're done growing in length, your bones will constantly be remodeling for the whole, your whole lifetime. But it's both the hormonal loop and the mechanical forces that act on your bone in terms of where you remodel. So we say that the hormonal loop, that calcium, that blood calcium level, determines whether and when remodeling occurs. The mechanical stress, so the forces you're putting on your bone, determines where you remodel your bone. All right, so let me give you an example. Again, let's go back to the ballerina example. Let's pretend I'm a ballerina. So I'm a ballerina and my blood calcium level is perfectly normal. It's not high, it's not low. Am I going to remodel my bone? Will I add bone? Will I destroy bone? No. Let's say I'm a ballerina and my blood calcium level is elevated. Am I going to remodel my bone? No. 
Yes, I have extra calcium. So what am I going to do to my bone? I'm going to build it up, right? I'm going to lay more bone down because I have extra calcium. I'm going to store it in my bones. Where I store it is going to be where I need it. If I'm a ballerina and I'm on point shoes, I'm going to need it in my ankles and my feet. So if my blood calcium is elevated, then I'm going to lay down new bone. I'm going to store that extra calcium in my bones and I'm going to do it in where I need it, right? Where I have all the stress, like in my ankles and feet. If I'm a ballerina and my calcium level is low, that's not good, right? I'm going to remodel my bones, but in this case, I'm going to destroy my bone. Where I destroy my bone, it's not going to be from my ankles and my feet because that's where I need it, right? I'm not going to take it out of there. I'm going to take it from somewhere else. So this is why we say the blood calcium level is going to determine if you remodel at all. And then the stress is going to determine where your bones remodel. Okay. Does anybody have any questions on that part, on the rest of our, you know, bones growing in length or bones remodeling? Everybody okay? So the last part of this lecture is on um, a couple of disorders and like if you break your bones, how does your body heal that break? Um, and so in order, before we talk about how you heal a break, let's talk a little bit about a fracture and different kinds of fractures, bone fractures. How do we name them and classify them? So typically if somebody breaks a bone, um, we classify them one of four ways that, is, that are listed up here. One is the position of the bone ends after the fracture. So if you have a bone and you have broken that bone, and let's say the ends of the bone are still perfectly aligned, we would say that that is a non-displaced fracture. In fact, the only way we really know it's broken is if you have an x-ray. A lot of times it might be a little bruised or swollen, but you got to have an x-ray. It doesn't look funny. A displaced fracture is when you break that bone and the ends of the bones are out of alignment, right? And this is going to cause the appendage or whatever has broken. You're going to be able to notice. It's going to look a little off, right? So that's a displaced fracture. The other one is the completeness of the break. So if you break a bone and it breaks all the way through the bone, we call it a complete fracture. If it doesn't break all the way through, it's an incomplete fracture. The other one is the orientation of the break to the long axis. So um, anytime you have a fracture where, like if this is my bone, my pan right here, um, if the break is kind of running down the diaphysis and it's kind of running parallel this way, um, we call that a linear fracture. <clears throat> and then we also have transverse fractures, which would be like if they run this way. So if like if I took my pen and just snapped it in half, right, and it broke this way, that's a transverse fracture. And then the last one is whether the ends of the bones penetrate through the skin. So a compound fracture, a lot of times we call this an open fracture, it's where the ends penetrate through the skin. Now obviously, if we go back to number one, this is a displaced fracture, but we don't have to say it's a compound displaced fracture because when you say it's compound, the ends are poking out the skin, we know it's displaced. We know the ends are not still in alignment, okay? A simple fracture, a closed fracture is where the ends don't come out through the skin. So here are a couple of common types of fractures with specific names that I'm going to walk you through. So the first one over here on the left, I'll just circle the names as we go. This is called a comminuted fracture. This is where if you look that you are looking down by the ankle. So this is sort of the lower leg. Um, and this is where the bone, when it breaks, it breaks into multiple pieces. This is very common in elderly individuals who have more brittle, fragile bones. When they break a bone, it's not usually a clean break. It's usually multiple small breaks in there. The next one on the right is a compression fracture. I know it looks kind of similar to a comminuted fracture, but I want you to think about the term compression, right? To compress, to squeeze. 
this is a fracture that happens if the bone has been crushed. So when the bone gets crushed, it's going to break into more than one piece. This is common in brittle bones, like bones that do have osteoporosis in them, but it's also common in traumatic accidents. So falls and car accidents, anytime the bone gets crushed. A spiral fracture. Um, so this is a really common sports injury. So this is where um, the bone is twisting as it's breaking. Um, so think like a soccer player or someone playing football. If they're pivoting and twisting and somebody tackles them from the side, um, a lot of times that bone is already sort of in motion as it's starting to break and you'll get that spiral fracture. So it's really common with those twisting forces. Um, I used to, I was a, a swimmer when I was younger and um, I was a lifeguard and a swim coach and I taught swim lessons and all that jazz. And um, it was the last day that the pool was open and we were getting ready to pull the plug. I'm from Ohio, so we don't leave water in our pools in the winter, they would freeze solid. So we have to pull the plug, drain the pools. And uh, we were getting ready to pull the plug. It was the last day the pool was open and I got in with some of the swim team kids and we were playing with a squirt gun. One kid dunked me from behind. I had the gun in my hand. Another kid was in front of me and he grabbed the barrel of the gun and tried to twist it out of my hand. But you know how like the trigger kind of like loops around your finger? Well, I let go of the gun, but he had already started twisting and my finger got stuck in that trigger and I was underwater and he twisted that gun all the way around and I could hear my bone break underwater. I could hear it go crack, 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 crack. And when I came up out of the water, my finger was laying back here on my on the back of my palm and um, it was bent at a 90 degree angle. So this knuckle was broken and then this knuckle was broken. My finger was kind of bent to the side. Um, and I had a spiral fracture through my finger. Um, you know, it was twisting as it broke. Um, it was broken in nine places. I had to have a plastic surgeon fix it. It's the only plastic surgery I'm ever gonna have in my life and it was wasted on my finger. <laughs> oh, I forgot one. We also have an epiphyseal fracture. Now, I kind of touched on this one already. Um, remember, this is when you are going through growth spurts. That epiphyseal plate, that growth plate gets a little thicker. Again, it's filled with cartilage, so it's a little softer, easier to break. Um, and so the problem though with an epiphyseal fracture is that there's no blood supply to your cartilage, and so it's gonna take a little longer to heal. A depression fracture is very common in a skull fracture. So it is when the bones of the skull get pushed inward. This is incredibly dangerous because you have soft nervous tissue under the skull. And I touched on this one in um, the, the, the recorded lecture from Monday. This one's called a green stick fracture. This is very common in children who have uh, soft bones. So remember, I talked to you in the first, uh, the lecture from Monday in chapter 6a lecture, I told you a little bit about the chemical composition of bone. And I told you how we have this organic matrix, which gives our bone sort of a structure. Then we have the inorganic matrix, which is calcium salt. And the calcium salt is what makes our bones hard. Again, think calcium, makes them nice and hard. Kids do not have a lot of calcium salt in their bone. Therefore, kids, their bones are more flexible, right? They're a little more spongy. Like my son will take a fall. My son plays hockey. He'll fall and he'll jump up and go, I'm okay. And I'm like, if, that, if I fell like that, I, I would have broken five things. Um, so kids, their bones are a little more flexible. And so what happens when typically, when a child breaks a bone, they get an incomplete fracture. But in a kid, we call that a green stick fracture. And I like the name of that because if you've ever been out in the woods, you know, and you pick up a stick and you try to break the stick, if it's still green on the inside, it doesn't break all the way, right? It kind of bends and then you have to like tear it apart. Um, and so this is a green stick fracture, very common in kids who do not have a lot of calcium salt in their bones yet. Okay, their bones are more flexible. They have more give to them. So they don't usually break all the way through. 
So those are just some specific types of fractures. Now, if you do break a bone, how do we heal that break? Um, so fractures can be treated a couple of ways. Um, the first thing we'll always do is there will be a reduction, which means the ends of the bones have to be aligned. Now, a lot of times um, there can be an external or a closed reduction. This just means that they'll do an x-ray. A lot of times they can manually manipulate those bones and get them back in place before they cast it. An internal or an open reduction, this means they're going to have to cut you open and they are going to have to secure the bones together with pins and screws. And so this is what I had on my finger. You can see I have a, a scar down my finger. Um, the surgeon had to slice my finger open and I have little tiny pins and screws all throughout my finger. Once um, your bone's been reduced and it's been realigned, that's what reduction means, realigned, then it's immobilized. Usually it's four to six weeks, especially if the bone is small or if we're dealing with children. The bigger the bone and the older you are, the longer you're going to be immobilized. You know, so if you are 50 years old and you've broken your femur, right, your thigh bone, um, you're going to be in a cast long, way longer than six weeks. You'll probably be casted for almost 12 weeks. Okay. It just takes longer as we get older. Now the stages of bone repair. I'm going to walk you through each of these stages here. Okay. So, oops, sorry. Um, so we're going to start with the first one, hematoma formation. All right. So this is showing you you've broken a bone, right? Remember bone is very vascular, has a fabulous blood supply. So when you break a bone, you are also breaking all the blood vessels in the area. So all of those torn blood vessels start hemorrhaging. You start bleeding out. And so this is why it's very common for you to get this big mass of clotted blood at the fracture site. And so this is why it gets really red, really swollen. Um, a lot of times it might turn black and blue. Um, it's very painful. It's inflamed. You're not going to want to move it. Okay, so that's hematomal formation, first thing that's going to happen. Next, what's going to happen is something called fibrocartilaginous callus formation. So what happens here is you form, we call it a soft callus. It's granulation tissue. Now, I mentioned granulation tissue when we talked about skin. When you get granulation tissue in your skin, you get a scab, right? It's kind of hard because it's exposed to the air in your body, inside your body, when you form granulation tissue, it stays soft because it's not exposed to the air, but it's the same concept. Granulation tissue has a huge blood supply, so it has lots of capillaries in it, and the capillaries are going to bring white blood cells to the area, phagocytic cells, they're going to clean up the debris, any of that, the broken stuff that's in there that needs to get removed. And then osteoblasts and fibroblasts, they're going to start rebuilding bone, osteoblasts. Fibroblasts, remember these are connective tissue proper, they're going to start releasing and making collagen fibers. Remember these are stronger than steel. And the collagen fibers are going to span the break between the bones and they're going to help to hold those ends together as you lay down new bone, as osteoblasts add the bone. And you're going to start to lay down some spongy bone. Eventually, you're going to form a, what's called a bony callus. So you're going to go from a soft callus to a bony callus. And you can see that bony callus in here. This usually will start to form about three to four weeks after you've broken your bone. And it will continue. Even after the cast has been removed, you're going to keep laying down bone. It'll keep forming for two to three months. Now, the last thing that always has to happen this is the last step. Step four is bone remodeling. Um, so when you break a bone, your body goes into overdrive to heal that break. So you can actually see in this image, you can see where the break was, right? It's thicker, right? Where that break was. I can draw a line right here. You can see the edges are much thicker right there. Um, and so the last step is always that your bones have to remodel and they've got to break some of the extra bone down that they laid down. Um, we used to have an instructor, an English instructor at Shelton, and um, he was a road biker, not like 
vroom vroom but a ching ching you know like a with a helmet road biker pedal pedal um and he was um biking you know road bikers they go pretty fast he was biking and hit like a depressed manhole cover a sewer cover and his front tire locked up when he hit it and it flipped him over and he shattered his pelvis he had to get life flighted to UAB and they had to use pins and screws and put it all back together. Um, and when he was finally able to come back to work, um, he was still going back for um, checkups and he had gone back for a checkup and his doctor said that his pelvis had gotten way too thick, but not to worry that his body would break that down. And so that's a great example of bone remodeling. Your body's going to go into overdrive to heal, but then you're going to break some of the excess down. The very last couple slides that I have are just a couple of imbalances that are associated with our bones. <clears throat> so the first one that's listed up here is osteomalacia. This is soft bones. This is when, um, as an adult, you do not have enough minerals in your bones. You don't have enough calcium salts in your bone. And remember, calcium salt is the inorganic stuff of your bone. It makes them nice and hard. So without that, your bones are soft. Um, and the main symptom is that when you put weight on your bones, like your weight-bearing bones, like your leg bones, or even your spine, um, or your pelvis, then you're going to have some pain in those areas because they're bending. Um, and so typically, this is just caused by you're not getting enough calcium or vitamin D in your diet. Um, normally, you know, we have a lot of very good social programs in the United States where, um, you know, we try to prevent um, adults and children from going hungry, especially children. Um, and so we don't typically see this very often in the United States. This is more common in other countries. Um, but it, we do sometimes see this in people who are not getting enough vitamin D, like shut-ins people who do not go outside, if you are not getting enough vitamin D, then your body cannot absorb the calcium from the food you're consuming. And so you will be calcium deficient. So it is important to get enough vitamin D. Um, so even if you're just taking a calcium supplement, you'll notice that there's vitamin D within that supplement, okay? Um, sometimes we might see this in women who are breastfeeding. They might develop osteomalacia. Um, when a woman is breastfeeding, it is not uncommon for her calcium stores to be removed along with her um, as she's making milk, as she's making breast milk. So it is important that breastfeeding women get calcium and vitamin D supplements. Now, the same condition in children is not called osteomalacia in children. It's osteomalacia in adults. It's called rickets in children. It's the same thing. It's where the bones in children are not adequately mineralized. We, they don't have enough calcium salts in them, causing the bones to be weak. Now, the problem in children is that they are still actively growing. So we'll see some deformities in their bones. Um, it'll affect their growth plates. We'll see deformities specifically in places like um, the skull, the pelvis, the spine, the rib cage. Um, again, and this is not having enough calcium and vitamin D in the diet. Again, we have great social programs in the United States um, where kids are, we make sure that our kids are fed. Um, so we don't see this often in the U.S. Um, sometimes, again, we can see it in babies who are breastfeeding. So if a breastfeeding mom is deficient, she's going to pass that deficiency on to her breastfeeding baby. So it is important, moms, that if you're breastfeeding, get your calcium and vitamin D supplements. Um, there is also, oh, what's it called? Polyvisol. I think that's what it's called. Um, there are like some liquid drops that if you're breastfeeding, you're supposed to give your baby to make sure they're getting their calcium and vitamin D. Again, you know, we've mostly eliminated rickets in the U.S. We only see some isolated cases, and it's usually passed on from a breastfeeding mom to a baby. These are some examples of rickets. Um, so you can see the legs, how bowed they are, especially down in here. 
um, especially when you put weight on the legs, they're going to bow more. Um, the treatment for rickets is truly just calcium and vitamin D supplements. Um, so even children who have deformities, if we can give them calcium infusions over the course of one year, those deformities will eventually go away. Um, so this is typically what we do in developing countries is we'll give children calcium infusions. Now, another imbalance with our bones is one I'm sure you all have heard of. You may have know, you may know someone with this condition. It's osteoporosis. This is where bone reabsorption, you're breaking your bones down, outpaces faster than bone deposition. Okay, so you break your bones down faster than you build them back up. It is normal for us to break our bones down and build them up. This is constantly what we're doing, right? That's bone remodeling. But as you age, sometimes you break them down a little faster than you can build them back up and your bones get soft, they get spongy um, and they get brittle. And so what we'll see is like spongy bone. So in our short, flat, irregular bones, spongy bone um, becomes the most vulnerable to osteoporosis, spongy bone of the spine in particular. Um, this is most common in women who have gone through menopause. So post means after menopause. Um, women, when we go through menopause, we essentially what happens is our ovaries shut down. We are no longer releasing eggs, but we are also no longer releasing our sex hormones like estrogen. Our estrogen levels plummet. Estrogen has a lot of very protective effects on our bones in terms of maintaining our calcium level. Once you've gone through menopause and you no longer have the protective benefits of estrogen, now you can start to lose calcium very quickly. So osteoporosis is much more common in women. Um, again, it affects the spine, but truly it can affect any spongy bone in the body. Um, and your bones, believe it or not, get so fragile that sneezing, coughing, stepping off a curb the wrong way, I feel like I do that every single day, um, that can cause your bones to break. I have, uh, we have a family friend who has osteoporosis. She went to bed one night, totally fine. She woke up the next morning with a fractured spine. Um, she broke her back and um, she did not fall out of bed. They think she just sort of twisted funny while she was sleeping. The treatment for osteoporosis is calcium and vitamin D. Get your calcium and vitamin D while your bones are still increasing in strength your bones will continue to absorb calcium and vitamin D until you're about 30. After 30, it doesn't do that much good for you. So make sure if you're young, make sure you're taking a calcium supplement. Increase your weight-bearing exercise. Now this one should make a lot of sense, right? We talked about bone remodeling and how your bones will remodel based on hormones and uh, gravitational and mechanical stress. So if you increase your weight-bearing exercise, lift weights, this is going to put stress on your bones and your body's gonna say, oh, I got extra calcium, let me store it in my bones. So weight-bearing exercise is really important. Um, I know women don't like to usually lift weights. I'm not saying you need to lift 50 pounds. Do five pound dumbbells, um, that's just plenty. Um, women who are going through or have gone through menopause can do hormone replacement therapy. It can help to slow bone loss. There are obviously going to be some trade-offs with that. Um, we also know that estrogen can lead to some cancers. And so if you have a history of estrogen-based cancer in your family, hormone replacement therapy is probably not an option for you. And if you are on hormone replacement therapy, there is a max. I think the max is like five years that they'll let you stay on it and they'll monitor you very closely. Um, there are some other drugs, some bisphosphonates. Um, these are once a year treatments. Um, they can help to really reduce bone loss by 70%. So that can be helpful. Also physical therapy, wearing like a weighted harness or weights around your ankles or around your wrists, they just help to increase the stress on your bones. So you're naturally gonna lay more bone down. Prevention of osteoporosis, get enough calcium while you can um, until you're about 30. Um, drinking fluoridated water. So I know that fluoride has a bad rap. Um, you know, don't, don't drink a ton of fluoride, but you know, the city, city water typically has uh, fluoride in it. Um, and 
Fluoride can make your bones nice and hard, just like it can help with your teeth as well. Um, in fact, dentists can tell uh, if you grew up in an area where there was a lot of fluoride in your water because your teeth are usually super hard. Um, there was an issue where parents started giving kids only bottled water and a lot of times bottled water does not have fluoride. So now they sell um, like small water bottles. I think they're called aquapods and they have fluoride in them. And so a lot of times they'll tell you, make sure that you're giving your child some fluoridated water for their teeth. Get plenty of exercise, weight bearing exercise if possible. And then the last one, decrease caffeinated soda intake. Um, so we know that caffeine can interfere with calcium absorption. So, you know, if you take a multivitamin and you drink coffee in the morning, do not take your multivitamin in the morning with your cup of coffee. You might as well just put the vitamin in the toilet and flush the toilet because that's where it's going to go. Um, caffeine interferes with the absorption of a lot of different vitamins and minerals. So it is best to take a multivitamin in the evening when you are not drinking caffeine. So they say to decrease caffeinated soda intake, mostly because if you're drinking a lot of caffeinated soda, you're also probably not drinking a lot of milk or water. Um, so, which are obviously going to be better for you and for your bones. I think this is the last one that I have on here is Paget's disease. Um, Paget's disease is excessive bone formation and breakdown. Um, and it is not uniform in any way. So it can cause very spotty weakening in some areas, and then it can cause very irregular thickening of bones in the other areas. And you can see the skull here. Um, it is usually found in the spine, pelvis, the femur bone, which is your thigh bone, and the skull. Usually happens after about the age of 40. We don't know what causes it. Um, we think it's genetic, and it may be turned on by a particular virus that you might come in contact with. Um, we don't exactly know. This image over here on the right, this is an image of a famous Viking named Egil. Um, and um, he is famous because there are stories about this Viking who took axes to the head and survived. You can see why. Um, Egil eventually died from Paget's disease. Um, lot, you lose your sight um, and eventually you're unable to eat, your bones fuse together. Um, so this is, um, there is no cure for Paget's disease. All right, um, so that is it for chapter six. Um, your lab that you're working on this week is um, really just, it's a pretty short PDF lab. It is looking at long bones and kind of the structure of long bones, being able to identify short, flat, or regular bones. Um, it's not a super hard one and it goes right along with the lecture, okay? Anybody have any questions?